Hello and welcome to this week's show. Um, as always, I am joined by Sh Shadow. And just before we get into anything else, I'm going to take you off of mute so they didn't hear you say that. I was just about to say that. I was about to say hello and remember to take me off mute this time. <laughs> yep. And oh my god, we've actually got the cameras coming through the same feed this time. So nice. Much better than last week. Definitely. It was an absolute disaster last week. Um, and now I'll be able to and now I'll be able to see everything that you showed to camera, which I couldn't do last week. I just had to imagine it. Mm, the irony is this week I'm not planning on showing anything to the camera, of course. It's always the way. <laughs> well, shall we get started? Let's, let's, let's get started. Okay, so as I said last week, I'm going through Malcolm in the Middle um, and season by season, uh, I'm going to pull out certain episodes to talk about, um, which um, we've both watched these particular episodes. I, I, I was I just about know. to I was just about to say that and this week, I'm actually going to start watching the same episodes so we can just have a discussion about the episodes for you all. Okay, so you want to do that like going forwards, not just as a one-off? Oh, yeah. Going forward, I will watch the same three episodes you want to discuss. Okay. Well, I'm going to be watching all of them just because I need to re-watch them to pick them out. Um, so with the first one, um, I want to talk about the fourth episode of season two, which is called Dinner Out. And it's a Stevie-centric episode in that it's Stevie and his family um, coming together with Malcolm and his family at a meal out. And the whole premise of the plot is um, Lois thinks it's a good opportunity to get to know them because they're kind of like um, what's the polite way of saying uh, they're like much much better off than what Malcolm's family are um, and she wants to get to know them um, and the other kind of subplot with the boys is kind of... Um... Before you start that, I just need to show you something on the floor. Go on. Where are we? Where is it on the floor? Uh, there we go. Uh, yeah, oh, what? <laughs> Let's see, it's down here. Where are we? Where's my camera? There we go. See it? Cody's still in the show. No. It's below you my waist. Swang. You swang. Metaphorically punching your arm. And you can explain what that is. Well, yeah, the subplot is essentially all of the boys, including Stevie, playing that game. The circle game. So, the whole point is to get them to see that circle, but as you Blow were in there, looking down, which I'm not going to do, because um, you've already did it. So, yeah, I was incredibly slow there. Wow. Um, okay, so, yeah, that's kind of the rough gist of the plot of that episode. Um, what I liked about this episode was, um, despite the fact that, yes, Stevie is played by an able-bodied actor, but let's just push that to one side for a second. The way that he is and his family dynamic is very much kind of Stevie's kind of wrapped in cotton wool almost, um, or like being very carefully looked after. Um, which well, I will. I've got obviously. I've got. Something to say about that as well, but shall we talk about that at the same time, or? I'll I'll say mine now because I'm like in the middle of it. Um, 
so yeah like he's kind of wrapped in cotton wool and there's a few incidents throughout the entire run of the show where that kind of comes up um there was an episode in season one which i think we might have covered last week i don't remember but anyway um it's kind of a retread on that same theme um but also um stevie's starting to rebel against that uh by um taking part in this circle game um so what was your thoughts of that particular episode so i'll start off with saying that uh, at the very start you could see how terrible the 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 boys food manners is at the table at the very start of the episode and how it's obviously was encouraging it by pretending there were seals and feeding them like like as such can you remember that part yep and Going back to what you just said, Stevie's mum is a typical smother mother. And um, it's really apparent throughout the whole series of how she is a smother mother. Have you heard that phrase before? Um, I haven't. I I would use the term um, like in reference to Stevie being a mama's boy more than no, her. No, no, no. But no, so so Stevie's a, so a smother mother is typically described as a mum who has a typically it's not always the case, but it's typically a mum who's got a disabled child and she likes to make keep keep him all cooked up and as young a child as possible and wrap him up in cotton wool and controls control his life and they obviously guilt trip him into being nice and kind all the time and. Typical, you know, that type, so she smothers him basically. Whilst I wasn't familiar with that term, um, I am familiar with that kind of um behavior, so that was very relatable. Um, I don't know whether you feel the same way. Uh, well, well, I, well, well my, for um, for Stevie's mom, yeah, yeah, well, I, well, she is a smother mother, absolutely a smother mother. But my point um, is, do you feel the same way when um, looking at like in, in, incidents in your own life? No, not don't think so. Not in my own life, no. Interesting. Because um, I, I definitely yeah. do. Um, so you think you've got a smother mother as well? I uh, oh, don't want to see that on camera. I wouldn't necessarily say it's one of them on over the other. I'd say it's both, to be honest. Yeah. But, well, yeah. But moving on, <laughs> I, I basically thought it was hilarious at, at the party at the military school that I got out of control. Interesting, because I... I um, didn't have any notes on that whatsoever because I was so focused on the A and B kind of plot. So, yeah, the yeah. party... The C uh, plot. Yeah. You might as well go into that. So, basically, um, Sp Spangler, at uh, the very episode of it, so Spangler, for those who don't know, is not the character from Ghostbusters, but is the head of the military school. And Spangler announces at the very start of the episode that he's got uh, his his mum is coming over and he doesn't want to be disturbed. And um, so he doesn't, he didn't, so he doesn't said he doesn't care what they do as long as he doesn't get disturbed. And what they decide to do is invite the local um, girls so Girls speak. of the community who are obsessed with them, yeah. Yeah, absolutely obsessed. Into and it, the and it into the military out, school. To be the worst side, yeah, it turns out to be the worst idea I've ever done, and it gets completely out of control. And you and you find out basically that um Spangler basically has invited a girl over. 
it's not yeah. nothing to do with his mum or anything like that. Yeah, which I thought was quite funny. And yeah, and then obviously, um, I basically said thought that um, going back to the A plot, I thought that Lois, Lois obviously she is a she is a B basically. You know she's a B. The B word. I'm not going to say it because I don't want to. Okay, I'll say it. She's a bitch. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, who can't cope with not having an argument with Stevie's mum? So she was trying her best to get her to sh- argue back at her, but she wasn't having any of it. Yeah, but, but then, also, but then, but then she completely exploded after years of co- uh, cooked up aggression. Stevie's mum. She. Uh, Asked for a certain drink, she didn't receive the one that she wanted. Um, but, but it was hill, uh, it, yeah, it's very, so we explained. So at the start, she asked for iced tea, but these, the server says they didn't have any iced tea, but people at other tables were getting hot tea. So Lois was trying to say, but if you've got hot tea, then you can make give her iced tea. Yeah, but um, she just, just doesn't like confrontation. Which yeah, I yeah, I'm I'm like I don't really like confrontation as such myself. Uh, but I although I do stand up for myself sometimes, but sometimes I like to like stay quiet depending on the situation. Would you say though that you're as bad as how um she was in that situation? Uh, some yes, if that's yeah, I would. I. Uh, Mm. Most of the time, I would probably stay quiet. But Interesting. Other, t- other I, times, but I think that I would probably say something. Um, if it was to just my out, although if it was against somebody else, I would say something. You know, I would say something. Mm-hmm. And if it was to my, if it's something to do with my allergies, then obviously I would say something. But if it, I, I hmm. It's a hard one. It depends on the situation, I guess. Well, let's say you're in the exact same scenario as what was shown in the show. Would you then speak up? If I, uh, I probably just have just have the drink they gave me. If I, I think I have done that before, they gave me the wrong drink. And I just took it. Hmm. I think I would definitely say something. Mm, well, it depends. Like, if I'm not, if it's if they gave me a more expensive drink and they didn't charge me for it, then you know, then I wouldn't say anything. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. In- in- interesting point of view there. Bring the money side of it into it. Okay. So, do you want to go on to the next episode, um, to talk about, or do you have anything more to add on uh, dinner's out? No, that's all I've got written down for that episode. So I'll move on to Hal Quits, which is yeah. the next episode. This one for me, um, it's very much, I'm only interested in the A plot. Um, I don't really remember what the rest of the plots were, um, or even if there was a B and, and C plot, but they, there usually is. Um my main focus on this one is Hal quits his job because of something that a kid says at a um, like show and tell kind of thing but like to show what kind of jobs they could have it's career stay on. thank you that's it's the like term that I yeah. couldn't think of um, so yeah he ends up quitting his job kind of um and the entire episode is him just focusing on getting this painting that he's got in his head out onto some kind of canvas and you never actually see the finished result which i think is brilliant because it just leaves it down to your imagination and you hear him talking about all of the different colors you see him being very extreme with how much paint he's putting on which is kind of a show within itself like 
I could watch somebody make yeah. art like that and be content, you know? So yeah, that that for me was like fantastic just because it was very art centric. And I can't draw to save my life, but I do like using colour. So um yeah, that's my whole takeaway from that entire episode. Well well I actually picked up on some of the B plot and C plot um for this episode. So I can maybe talk about that bit. Yeah. So okay. as you, as as I said, Hal goes as you said, Hal goes crazy and quits his job. And uh, he gives, uh, uh, towards the start of the episode, the boys were asking him for some advice of issues they had. And Hal gives the most stupid advice. And then, so, um, Reese basically is helping, De- it's, it's Dewey, isn't it? Dewey. So Reese was helping Dewey with his bullying problem. And her, his bully was, he was trying to think of a, like a name to call back to, to Dewey because Dewey's getting called a dwarf, I think he's getting called. The little dwarf. You can't oh, remember yeah. this bit, can yeah. you? Something like that. A tiny dwarf. And her his Billy's name was so so he asked her, Need to, well, think of a name that we can call her back. So what's her name? And Dewey replies, Regina Tucker. And obviously I thought it was a, a funny name. Um yeah. Um that kind of writes itself. <laughs> yeah. And obviously I thought it was a joke for the older viewers. But Definitely. Um, he said, and it, but I don't think uh, Reese got that name either. He just said, oh, we'll think of something. And then I thought the, the lucky aid manager, um, who's played, uh, uh, who's, um, um, I didn't actually write down who the lucky aid manager's actor's name was, but he isn't this person that he reminded me of, but he reminded me of Wayne Knight, the actor Wayne Knight. Who played the bad guy computer technician in Jurassic Park? Oh right. So you know the ah ah ah. Yep. You, you know that I guy. know the guy you mean, yeah. But um, the lucky aid manager reminded me of him. I'll see if I can get a picture, and I'll uh, show everybody. Uh, I have to show up my phone because obviously I have privileges. So uh, lucky aid manager. Uh, um, he also looks a bit like Josh Gad as well, to be fair. But there you go. That's the lucky manager. Yeah, I I knew who you meant. I'm not a big fan of that particular character, to be honest. I wish they'd wrote him out after season one, but uh, yeah, they strung him through too many plots. But, uh, yeah. yeah. And then only the last thing I saw was I thought it was hilarious that that house painting got destroyed at the very end after he completed it, or as he completed it. Yeah. But you, but, but you knew something was going to happen. You knew it was just going to happen. Yeah, it, it was just building and building to that point. Which like, no, was... no, no, like, no, like, uh, canvas was to the stand that amount of paint being put on it. Definitely not. And... I think that was the whole point of it. Like you weren't supposed to ever see the art, and it was all always supposed to be a piece of art of the mind, and just watching him get it out of his head was the art within the show. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like art within art. So yeah, absolutely. Do you want to go on to the next one, or do you have anything else to add? Yeah. No, I've got, so we'll just move on to the next episode, which was Bowling. Yep, which was episode 20 of um, season two. And um, Hal Quits was episode 14. I don't remember whether we said that earlier on. Um, and then episode, and then uh, um, Dinner Side was episode four. Yeah. So the reason why I picked the Bowling one is because it was quite a big deal that they showed two different timelines essentially in a 30 minute comedy show um yeah so um, i thought yeah so i thought that the split reality concept was a good interesting idea for the show yeah and i don't think it's been done since 
in any other show. Um, so the whole point of it was which parent takes them bowling depends on so many different factors um, that ha happen um, while they're at bowling. And, 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 see, and, and some, yeah, and something which Hal did in one reality affected what he did in the other reality. So, for example, um, I didn't actually write this down, but I just remembered it just now. For example, in the uh, when when they take when they go to the bowling alley, um, and and the, the in the reality where Lois takes the boys to the bowling alley, she opens up her purse and there's no money there. Um, so she'll only be able to get one pair of shoes, bowling shoes. Whereas when you go to the Hal Hal's reality, he talks about how he took money from Lois's wallet and that paid for their bowling shoes. Do you know what? I, I didn't even pick up on that. I was so focused on like trying to figure out which timeline we were in at certain points because it gets really confusing as it as it goes along yeah but i kind of like that because it meant you had to really pay attention absolutely yeah you could like you could it was an episode you could uh, read your phone on by watching it's that's one you had to actually pay, pay full, full attention on yep i had to pick that episode just to make you sit through it and make sure that you watch it totally yep so, but, out, yeah. out of the three of them, which episode would you say was your favourite? Uh, probably the bowling episode, to be fair, uh, and the, and um, and the dinner out. But yeah, is that is that all you're going to say about bowling? Yeah, that's all I can really say. All right. Okay. So I've got a bit more I can add to it. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, so the split, and I thought that Lois and it's really apparent about Lois's helicopter parenting style um, in that particular episode. It's a good example for helicopter parenting, and obviously it's an embarrassment. Before I continue, do you know what helicopter parenting is? I don't for sure, but I can kind of figure it out. But feel free uh, to. So I'll explain. So uh, basically, helicopter parenting is our parents who pay extremely close attention to their kids' activities and schoolwork in an effort to not only protect them from pain and disappointment, but to help them succeed. Helicopter parents are known to hover over their children and become overly involved in their lives, which is obviously what Lois does. Interesting. Yeah, she does. Um, but it's very hit and miss. Yeah, she she she's always complaining at them, but I think that's just because she wants the best from them. Yeah. Uh, but like all like all, like most parents do want best for their children, but she goes goes over the top. And that's why she's a helicopter parent in my mind. Well, you um, say that, but when you see her parents come in, I don't remember which episode this is. Um, but they're just awful. Yeah. She's basically like an even worse example, I think. Yeah, but the, I also think that how in this particular episode, how is a, well, he always is, but how is a pushover? And I thought uh, poor, uh, and I thought, I also thought quite towards the end, I thought and this was in reality where um, it was Lewis taking the boys to the bowling alley. Um, it was that, I thought it was embarrassing that um, Malcolm, uh, when he had a big tantrum, basically, let's put it lightly, he did have a tantrum and got frustrated at his mum. So he went right up the bowling lane to try and just sing. If you want to see it, because he was always missing the strikes, yeah. missing, missing the strike, always missing the pins. And he said, Do you want to see a strike? I'll give you a strike, basically. And he walked up the. <laughs> yeah, and the he still managed to and not he, hit a and he pin. Threw it. I still managed not to hit a single pin. And I thought uh, uh, it was really embarrassing. But in the other concept, uh, Malcolm was uh, was, a, was excellent at bowling. And um, it was at this episode where Hal 
was basically getting a perfect score, perfect 300 in bowling. Yeah. But Malcolm ruined it because he was having uh, basically relations with his uh, girlfriend. He was caught making out. Just caught it Yes, back. cut. <laughs> yes. You're making it sound so much more rude than what it was. Uh, yes, yeah, so... over it. I was in, and then, but then at the very end, uh, uh, so, yeah, so as I said, was how was a pushover, and this uh, and Dewey was very. I basically thought that Dewey was very manipulative at the very end, which I thought was quite funny well, in both instances. With his dad, like that throughout, anyway. Yeah, yes, yeah, so I thought I thought it was funny that when he was he got his dad to fall asleep and he ordered pizza. And they have no had no money concept and just gave him hand over two credit cards to the pizza guy, but then also manipulated his mum at the very end to get to watch some TV at the end. Yeah. That was pretty cool. Like she was like, Yes, no, yes, no. And then she was like, Right, you're gonna watch TV, but it's gonna be something that you're not gonna like. So it was Thief Ban. She got she put it on for him. Yeah. I'm not really sure what that is, to be honest. It's uh, basically, it's a publicly funded television network, like political type thing. Oh, right. Okay. I can see why they chose that. Okay. So, I do have some other stuff to talk about. Uh, but, shall we go on to your stuff and then come back to mine towards the end? Sure. Okay, so, um, I know you're wanting to talk about the books that you've been reading so do you, do you want to start there yeah um oh you want me to start first so yeah i thought you said that you wanted to, I, thought, no, no. I thought you said you wanted to start first all right so i've now finished the guardians of gahul owl series um well i've not read page, book 16 yet or the two spin-off books but book 16 is basically a prequel to the main series so that the actual and then book two is like tales and history of the of the great tree and of the world so books one to 15 basically is the main chunk of the like the main timeline well apart from books 9 10 11 which i said earlier which is like a, a, a prequel to the main series but in essence one to 15 is the main series and i finished that and for me, I'm quite sad that like it's the main series is over because obviously I was so ingrained into that series and it's a bit sad that I don't have any more like scripts to read in that series. And um, but it ended quite I'm not gonna say how it ended because obviously I don't want to give any spoilers, but it it ended in a surprising way and a way I was not expecting. And I need, it actually was quite poetic the way it died, the way it, the way it died, the way it ended. But uh, wow, spoilers! <laughs> <laughs> the way it ended, but I'm not saying anybody died, but uh, the way it ended, and um, yeah, it's really quite good. And actually, the story kind of continues on now because I've now onto the Ice Bear series. Basically, polar bears, but they get called, but the series is called Ice Bears. And um, this series is set, I would say, many years after the events of Book 15. Because the main the main character, Soren, which obviously is, if you've seen the movie, you probably, you know who Soren is, if you've seen the movie, haven't you? Uh, I haven't seen the movie, and you say that name, and Lord of the Rings just comes to mind. So, <laughs> yeah. So no. Well, um, the movie is sort of okay. So the movie is called Guardians of the Hill. Uh, is the uh, um, main se- series? Uh, is it called Guardians of the Hill? This the movie is is something like that, uh, or the Guardians or something, um, and it basically combines books one to three into the movie, into an hour and a half movie. It's and never good when they, they do that. that. No. And they changed some of the some of the, the, the plot. 
So, for example, this happens really at the start of the book. So, um, in the in the book, um, Soren gets taken in, in the movie. In the book, Soren gets taken to Saint Ag Saint Aggies or Saint Agalinian or whatever it's called school for orphaned owls. And basically, it's they get kidnapped and get taken there, and they're basically slaves for the pure ones. And the pure ones are basically this race of of elite owls who believe that Taito Albas, which are barn owls, are the, the elite race of barn owl. Okay, so of owl. how does the um, Ice Bear books compare to all the other books in the series? Oh, it's light. It's completely light. Um, so, uh, so I'll come back to that. So basically, the bit they change in the movie is, in the book, it is Claude, his brother, who knocks him out of the tree, who then gets kidnapped to um, St. Aggie's. But in the movie, both of them, both, both his brother Claude and Sorn, gets taken, which is a ch big, it's obviously is a massive change from the book. But anyway, so the, the Ice series basically, I would say it probably takes place, well, Sorin is probably middle aged by book 15. Or maybe not middle aged, but maybe like just coming to adulthood. Like he's no longer a year. Like he's probably if it was if it was compared to like like human years, I would say Soren by the end of book fifteen is about twenty eight or thirty, kind yeah. of. And then in the ice bear ice bear series, Soren is probably in his sixties, sixties or seventies. Okay, so you think it's a good so, thirty years. In the future, yeah, quite a big bit because he's elderly. He's described as elderly in okay. the Ice Bear series, um, and they haven't met Soren yet. Soren has been mentioned, so there's been a so actually it's kind of funny because uh, in one chapter it went away from the Ice Bears and the uh, to um, the Owls at the Great Dahul Tree. And they were having like a meeting in the parliament. Basically, it's because Cleve, um, one of the characters called Cleve, who is basically one of the who, who basically is who lived who lived in the northern kingdoms, the one at the Blocks and Brothers retreat. But um, he was flying over the uh, and saw the ice that the, the the cubs talking about where they're going to be going, which is basically their mission for the, the Ice Bear series. And then flew off to um, back to the Great Dahul Tree to report his findings. His rep um, and that's when you get to see Thorin. But I'm guessing t maybe in the f like in the future of the books, we'll see more of um, like the owls within the main series, within the owls se the bear sounds, series. Sounds like you might, yeah. Um, without Thorin, obviously, obviously if. Yeah. The, like... Sorn so, Sor will be there. He's still, he's still um, a main character in the. Um, he's still a main character within the Owl Kingdoms. Okay. Without giving you any spoilers, he's still a main part of the of the Owl Kingdom at the Great Cahul Tree. So. So, how many more books have you got to go before you're done with the entire world? So I'm currently on book two of the Ice Bear series. So I'm about halfway through that. And then I've got book three to read. And then I've got books one to one to of the Wolf series to reread. And then obviously I've got books one to six of the Wolf series. And then I'm going back to book 16 of um, the main series. And then I've got the two spin-off books. So all in all, I have got six, seven, well, if you count the book reading, eight, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven books to read. Okay, so how long do you reckon it'll take for you to get through that series, going from those I re books? I reckon about 33, 34 days. Wow, that's quite fast. So I'm reading a book every three days, basically. That's kind of what I was doing last year, because um, last year I was 
rereading the Alex Alex Ryder books, um, and I finally read the ones um, that came years later, because um, the original stopping point for the Alex Ryder books was book nine, which was uh-huh. Scorpio Rising. Um, oh, and then he done a sort of prequel slash standalone, um, which I can't remember the name of the book, but it was more focused on one of the villains of the series, more than Alex, but it ah. showed how interplayed um, Alex's life was with him, um, which it was actually one of my favourite books, and I don't even remember what it was called. Um, but yeah, I read 10 books by the end of January last year. This year, I've only read, um, let's see, um, Jurassic Park, and then I've done uh, The Mystery of the Blue Train, uh, The Big Four, and... There was another Agatha Christie one that I can't remember the name of. Um, and that's it. So, four books in one month, which is still pretty good, but, like, nowhere near as, as many as last year. And, unf- unfortunately, um, with the Agatha Christie books, I finally found the one that I'm not that fond of. And All right, was, why is that? Well, it was the mystery of the blue train. I really wanted to like it because it um, created these images in my head just from the title alone. And unfortunately, it felt like she had too many characters. She didn't know what to do with them. And uh-huh. um, the reader was ahead of the detective the entire time. Where normally it's very much uh, um we don't know who's who the killer was um until the very end when he's kind of explaining the entire thing um which we still get that but I kind of figured it out long beforehand because it mm-hmm. takes seventy pages before Hercule Pyro comes into it. So that was kind of a bit of a bum book for my last book of the month, and um, the last few days of the the month, um, I've just been putting together my next month's um to be read pile, which I'll be putting on my Instagram, um, like the fest of next month. So. Um, I mean, I can always just show it to you because I know you're not too active on uh, Instagram. But uh, yeah, um, just before we go on, um, feel free to follow us on all of our social media. They're on the screen the entire time. Um, Mine is, for the most part, Little Retro Rocker 6. Apart from my... um, Instagram, which is retro books and stuff, and my um, story graph, which is retro books 666. Uh, so feel free to follow me on all of the things. And do you want to give and your... my Yeah, and my channel is youtube.com slash Arthur's Rolling Vlog, all one word. And I'll have all of that in the description. Um, of the highlight on Twitch and on the YouTube video playback. So, with that said, uh, do you want to go on to the next thing or should we go on to my next that's, thing? That, that's all I had to discuss. Okay. Well, my next thing, um, I've kind of already covered one of them because I've talked about the disappointing Agatha Christie book. That said, I do plan to read more of them, so it hasn't put me off. 
Um, the next thing I want to talk about is Doctor Who, in particular the classic series. Um, still working my way through the season seventeen um, box set, which I don't have to hand with me because uh, it's currently way over there. Um, but um, up to the episode Shada which is the only one of Tom Baker's entire um, run, like, of all of the years that he was doing the show, where there's an incomplete episode. And honestly, if it wasn't for the strike action that was going on at the time, I really think this would have been one of the best... Um, stories of season 17 so um, for those that don't know um, Sharda is essentially um, the Doctor and Romana who is a time lady that he's traveling with um which i do find it interesting that in the classic series he ended up traveling with another time lord essentially um and they end up going to uh old college to meet up with a professor who turns out is another time lord um and Unfortunately, because this is a like in incomplete episode, um, parts of it had to be completed with animation, um, bringing back all of the surviving cast to do the voices for the animated bits, um. So it's a bit jarring watching this story because it can be live action one minute, and then it'll have an animated scene and then it'll go back to live action um, and it's like that throughout um, and I'm just glad that we were able to get as complete as possible for that story because it is a really good story um, but BBC in particular BBC America don't want to fund the animated reconstructions anymore so i don't know how we're going to get the missing episodes on a physical release if they're not doing the animated things anymore because they have the audio of the original episodes um in particular the first two doctors most of their stuff is missing um and i think some of the third doctor as well um, but not, but not quite as as many, um. So, my thinking was that we're going to do the animated reconstructions for the missing episodes, and then have them as like season sets, as they've been doing with the um like how the show should look, sets so far, um. But if they're not going to do the animated things how are we going to get those missing episodes you know i honestly mm -hmm. don't don't think we are now yeah it sounds like it's not going to happen they are talking about doing um i forget the terminology that they use uh but like restaging the old sets and doing them as like new episodes but still having the old style to them. But it's going to be very, very jarring having a different actor doing the role for those missing stories. So, like, um, Marco Polo, for example, it's the first of the missing episodes, um, sorry, the missing stories, rather, from the first Doctor's era, um, which I think technically 
is the third serial uh but the beginning box set when they were doing them on dvd had um the first story which i don't remember the name of then it was the dalek episodes um and then it, it was marco polo i think and then whatever the third one in the box set actually was um I'm not that familiar with the first Doctor, so I don't remember all of the names of all of the stories. Um, but it is something that I'm interested in in seeing um, or experiencing the story in some capacity just to kind of experience it, you know? Mm-hmm. So, yes. Um, go on. Is the classic series of Doctor Who something that you'd be interested in um, watching ever? Like uh, I used to watch a couple of episodes, but not like the really old ones, like the episode of the guy that wore the checked shirt. Was it a checked jacket? Something like that. Was it a checked jacket? I've seen a couple of episodes of that. Uh, it might have been Colin Baker for that one. Yeah, Colin Baker, yeah. I've seen a couple of episodes of with him, but I'm mostly interested in the more modern episodes, so right. the current series, like. Okay, cool. Well, some of the modern stuff does kind of give throwbacks to some episodes, um, so that's kind of what got me interested in watching the older stuff. Um, uh-huh. And if, if I'm honest, I've seen all of the stuff from Tom Baker up to the end of the show's original run and it definitely goes downhill from um, Tom Baker leaving. It's very g- gradual. Um, I'd say Peter Davison uh, his is the last of the good doctors and it's not a reflection on the actors, because they were doing a fantastic job with what they were given. It was very much a case of the BBC didn't want to up the show's budget whatsoever, and it couldn't compete with, like, Star Wars, which is what people were comparing it to. So it's kind of unfair to do that. I mean, they're only just about um, caught up visually uh now with the modern who um and it's very much gone the same way now like i'd say out of the new stuff the ninth and tenth doctors were the best and then it's been a slow decline ever since yeah i i i well there's a top was who was the tenth doctor the 10th that doctor was, was David Tennant. Yeah, there's talk that they're bringing David Tennant back. Part of me wants that and part of me doesn't. Because that's going to be confusing. I mean, they've already had to resort to bringing back Russell T. Davies on the behind-the-scenes stuff to get fans interested in the show because the interest just isn't there anymore. Um, well, I think it's the interest is there, but I think the latest Doctor, although she was she was good, I don't think she was could compete with the other Doctors. She's done a fantastic job. It's oh, she has. It's Chris Chibnall who is the showrunner. The show is not a good fit for him. No, That's... she didn't get a good right. And the writers weren't that great either, I don't think, for her episodes. There's been one or two good ones. Um, I liked her introduction and the one where um, they end up um, causing the um, Rosa Parks bus incident. Uh Uh-huh. Um, but 
apart from that, they're the only good stories, in my opinion, of her entire, what, two, three years that she's done this uh -huh. show. So, that, that's kind of like what I mean when I say the show's downhill a bit. Um, but, like, every show goes through that. Like, it goes up and down. It's just with Doctor Who being such a long-running show, you see it more because it's, it goes like this. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, but, yeah, that's kind of all I had to say about that. Yeah, well, hopefully it starts to get better with, this, with the new Doctor, whoever it is. And if yeah. it isn't David Tennant, I want to be Idris Elba. Honestly, I'd be happy if they made the fugitive doctor the next one. Hmm. Maybe. I don't know. Because she seems to have got a lot more piss recently. Yeah, well, we just need to see what happens when it gets announced. Yeah. I mean... I'd love it if it was somebody new who we've never heard of, because that's generally what they do. Um, and then the show kind of propels them into, like, uber stardom. Um, so I kind of want that to stay part of the show, you know. But Obviously, we've... David Tennant, has, uh, the modern ones, I think David Tennant's had the most success. Definitely, yeah. Well, that's really, I think, all I can say about it as well, to be honest. So, is there anything else that you want to add? Because we're actually well on the time by, like, a few minutes. Yeah, about, about four minutes. Yeah, no, there's nothing else I could add. And I've got a dog staring at me just now. <laughs> Wanting his deep word. Ah, yes, he wants food. Okay. Just for the benefit of the viewers at home, viewers... He's looking at me. Hey, Cody. <laughs> Bless him. Yeah, he wants his food. I won't say his trigger word, because that's just cruel. Well, I, I could say one thing extra. Um, I'm very slowly making my way through uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe and... I've watched one movie since last week in that whole series. Um, I watched Guardians of the Galaxy. It's not the first time that I've seen it, um, but it's definitely my favourite of um, Phase 2, for sure. Yeah, I, I love the Guardians series. And obviously Rocket is my favourite superhero. Yeah, for obvious reasons. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think his attitude is hilarious. Um, Definitely. Yeah, I just ca I can't wait until part three. Yeah. Volume, uh, volume point, three, rather, I should say. At one point, we weren't going to be getting uh, part three. But now we are, so yay. Which is going to be good. But we'll just need to wait and see when that happens. It's probably going to be 2023. Quite possibly, yeah. But um, we'll need to wait for that. So, I've only got, I think, two movies left of Phase 2. Um, and the last one is Ant-Man. And I don't think I've seen that one. So, Phase 2 was definitely where I kind of petered out of watching the movies. Because Phase 3, apart from... Guardians 2 um, I haven't seen any of um, that's coming through on my end oh sorry I was, I was, getting, I was somebody called me okay um, I have no idea what what that was I'm guessing it was you ringtone yeah okay well that's that sounds like a good um point to end on since all you've been called and oh. uh, Cody needs food. Oh. 
So yeah, and we'll see you next see you next week. And remember, we hope you had a really good time. Bye, everyone. Bye.